It's a, it's a real pleasure to be at Azite Summit in Athens, no less at the planetarium. I was reflecting this morning that this is a particularly good choice of venue, among other things, because it's a sober reminder to crypto projects the world over that the namespace of the cosmos is fully saturated. There are no more uh, celestial bodies or phenomena for you to name your projects after they have all been taken. Uh, so please keep that in mind when you're starting something new. The second reason is this is perhaps, at least when I was growing up here in Athens, this was the primary place for middle school field trips. I think I went on three. I changed middle schools a couple times, so they, they start you over again, which I hope serves as a great inspiration for the aspiration of today's talk, which is simplicity. And in that context, what I want to do is I want to share what I hope is a parsimonious framework for understanding succinct proofs and protocols. This is not the most general such framework that we could come up with, but just the simplest one that can nonetheless allow you to do a little bit of damage. The idea here is, of course, succinct proofs and protocols. You take something very big, very hard to verify, potentially cosmically interesting, and reduce it to something simple and pedestrian uh, with a little bit of randomness and incurring some soundness error along the way. So we're going to try to describe why that thing is even a reasonable thing to do in the first place using just a little bit of linear algebra, a smattering of error correcting codes, and perhaps a little bit of basic probability. Some notation is going to be introduced in a smattering throughout, but that's going to be the core idea. And to start with, oh, and I should say this is part, partly joint work with my colleague Guillermo Angeris, who we co-authored a paper with called uh, er um, Zero Knowledge Proofs and Linear Algebra, which we caught at the end of last year. I think we have, we, I might have a QR link at the end. And the, there's a separate sessions, I forget, like ZK study sessions or whatever it was, with Guillermo where he presents that whole thing as a course. This is a condensed version of that. We're gonna go over some of the basic results in that paper, just the notation and the framework. And then as a treat, for all of you, we're going to do something that's not in the paper that's somewhat new. Okay? So we're going to start out with frameworks, and we're going to ask, what is a good framework? And I'll let you be the judge as whether this is a good framework or not. It is an attempt at a good framework. And hopefully a good framework can utilize a simple set of tools to nonetheless explain a lot of interesting things. And I'd say broadly in succinct proofs, we have two types of frameworks. Ones that are super general and describe almost all protocols at a very high level of abstraction and general reductions therein. These are more recent and are now starting to become more popular in some papers that have been coming out more recently. They are nonetheless mostly blunt. They work at a level of abstraction that's very high. You can't easily use them to prove things or construct new types of systems or protocols. And then there's like application-specific things which you can use in constructing proofs of soundness of whatever protocol you create or creating protocols and the like. So this is going to be somewhere in the middle. Okay, and. We're going to get into it. We're going to hopefully just create a library of these things, produce a little bit of notation, and then see how these things could compose potentially in interesting ways to create new types of succinct proofs and protocols. So hopefully, as a positive side effect of that, we can understand why intuitively succinct proofs work and potentially use them to do new and interesting things, which I'll try to do something moderately new and interesting in the second half of this presentation but hopefully not straying too far from the goal of simplicity. Okay, so at a high level, I'm gonna go over a basic protocol that everybody should be familiar with, which is gonna be the polynomial zero check. This is ubiquitous, we use it all the time. We basically do that in linear combinations, that's the punchline of this throughout ZK. So we're gonna go through that, we're gonna introduce the notation and the framework that we have in the context of an example as opposed to in the abstract. And then we're gonna start doing some damage with something a little bit more interesting, which is going to involve some work by, I see, Ben Diamond and Jim Posen, this paper on logarithmic randomness. We're gonna to try to replicate at least a big part of that proof with what seems to be a slightly better soundness error, and that's gonna be uh, thanks to Minro, who got a really good generalization of it. So, okay, so let's start. Polynomial zero check. We all know and love. We're gonna start with a field. We're gonna define a polynomial over that field of a certain degree bound. And then we're going to say that if we evaluate that polynomial at a uniformly randomly chosen point in the field, and that evaluates to zero, then we can infer with high probability that the polynomial itself is the zero polynomial. This is pedestrian. I'll pause for a second. 
but everybody should be familiar with this by now. And so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna rewrite this using the first thing we're gonna introduce is probabilistic implications. And we're just going to say in the standard way that f of r, so f evaluated r equals zero, implies with soundness error at most p that f is identically the zero polynomial. Okay, and the soundness, this p is just given again by the degree bound in the standard way we, we all know and love. Okay, so now we're gonna rewrite this a little bit more, and we're just gonna introduce a little bit of linear algebra. It's gonna say the same thing. We're not gonna do anything new or interesting thing here. So we're gonna start with a generator matrix with a Reed Solomon code or a Van der matrix. We're going to pick a random row indexed by R of that matrix, and then we're going to take this product of GR transpose X. We're gonna say that that is essentially equal to F of R, sort of by definition, and then we're gonna check that that G transpose R of X, which is the coefficient vector of the polynomial. I'm just gonna take the coefficients and put them in a vector, and then multiply by GR transpose. We're gonna check that that is equal to zero, and again, with probability, with soundness error at most P, we're going to infer that the coefficients are zero. This is equivalent to saying that the polynomial is zero. So, so far we've taken step one, we've taken it into probabilistic implications. Step two, we've done something very basic and trivial, which is we've just rewritten it, not involving the esoteric properties of polynomials or anything, just rewriting in basic linear algebra. Again, I'll pause you as a little bit of math on this slide, but it's very basic. Okay, so why do this? I think the first thing is you can ideally start to utilize the composition of these implications to prove potentially more interesting things. This is not a remarkably interesting thing that I'll do here, but I'll just give you a basic example. We can chain two probabilistic implications to say something a little bit more complicated than the single variate polynomial case. So let's take a coefficient matrix of a bivariate polynomial with degree bound n minus one in each of the two variables. And then we're gonna take two rows randomly, indexed by R and R prime respectively, of the generator matrix, and we're going to do the standard matrix vector product. So we're gonna first multiply by GR, that matrix, and then by GR transpose, and we're gonna check that that thing is zero, which is going to imply that the middle thing here is equal to zero. Again, with soundness error at most P, and then, which in turn is going to imply that the entire matrix is zero. Now, these probabilities will sum across these two implications in the worst case, which is gonna give us our standard Squared simple bound. We do actually have in the paper, and this is not to put on slides at a conference, certainly not at the end of a conference, a slight tightening of what we're usually, we usually use in the Swartz simple lemma that's an appendix in the paper if people are interested in checking that out. Okay, so we've done nothing interesting or new at this point. We've just introduced new notation, and that's just going to be useful now in moving on to something that's a little bit closer to the cutting edge of the field, no pun intended we will prove a hopefully slightly tighter version of the result of logarithmic randomness by Diamond and Posen. This is, so we're gonna start with a subspace with distance d, and we're back in error correcting code land, so what we're gonna to refer to as distance d here is just going to be the minimum disagreement between, let's say, two code, two code words and a code. Okay, and then we're going to define the distance of a matrix with two k columns, two to the k columns, as just take a matrix, I probably should have had a slide with the definition here. So just take, take a matrix X and take, a, take another matrix Y whose columns all lie in the subspace and consider that difference of some, any matrix X and Y. Okay, and take the closest one of those, for example, and just say, what is the minimum number of, so what is the number of sort of zero non-zero rows, right? So the columns, we transpose it. So normally you see it in, the code words are in rows. I see you struggling with that one. We just transpose it. Like, it just makes the linear algebra a little bit easier. So, so take the, the columns, right, and subtract out the ones where the columns are entirely contained in the space and then consider the non-zero rows. So if like two columns, right, are not in that, then that'll just be counted once, right? So two columns differ at that same index, right? That's just gonna be counted once, okay? So that's gonna be the notion of distance of the matrix to the subspace. And the rewriting of the basic result is going to be that we're going to take this matrix vector product of this matrix X with this tensor product, YR, okay? So notice again, this is a logarithmic number of random elements. We have two to the K columns, we have K of these random entries. 
And this matrix vector product is going to be a sufficient witness such that we can make the implication that if the distance of that to the subspace, given this, this, this proximity parameter Q, which is less than D over three, again, with soundness error at most P, implies that the original matrix was close to the subspace. And we're going to do it with what seems to be a slightly better bound than what we, we gain a bit here. It's not very significant, but slightly better than what we've seen in the paper so far. Okay. So this is a particularly interesting result, not only because we love to shill all the time, we are investors, and all the time it's a really well-written paper, you should read it. It is also one of the fastest breakdown-like schemes, and the main reason for that is, is that you can view this X, Y, R product as a partial evaluation of a multilinear polynomial, which lets you merge the query, the, the commitment and query phases of breakdown uh, slash the hero-like protocols. It's also, the original Benius paper uses this as the algorithm core. They do some cool things with packing and so forth. It's not necessary that you use the really cool data structure in Benius that was presented earlier today with this particular framework, but I think still the fastest prover of for Benius is using this, so maybe next that fastest prover period uh, is using this abstraction. So we think it's particularly interesting and happens to be a more recent, slightly more involved result to hopefully demonstrate that you can do cool things by just chaining applications together. Okay, so we're going to start with something that is due to Min sitting over there who got the, who got the general, we got it for D over four and he was able to generalize it all the way up to D over three for the proximity parameters. So we're gonna take two matrices and we're going to take this linear combination with these coefficients given by, again, these R prime and one minus R prime, which again, R is uniformly, R prime is uniformly randomly drawn from the field. Right, and we're going to check that that thing is Q close to the vector space, to the subspace, and then we're going to say with soundness error at most P that the matrix whose columns consist of X1, X2 is also close to the subspace. And we're going to do that with this bound. We are not going to prove this here. This is sort of, you have to do this in the old fashioned way. You have to sit down like you did with pencil and paper and prove it, and we make no claims that probabilistic implications will suddenly solve that for you. You still have to do a little bit of math. Okay. So now we're gonna take that result and just by using a little bit of induction and hopefully just chaining a couple of these implications together, do all the rest of the work. And again, this is what we're trying to prove, which was from the previous slide, that this matrix vector product, we should check that, then the matrix is close to the subspace and we're good. And we're gonna do it, of course, by induction. So first we're gonna start by sort of unrolling this tensor product. We're gonna take that very last entry and separate it out, we're gonna call this everything, all the K, the tensor product all the way up to K minus one, uh, Y tilde, and then we're just gonna take that final thing and tensor that just, this is just definitions of the Kronecker product. Okay, we haven't done anything. And so given that these, things two are, these two things are equal, their distance is of course the same to the subspace. And then this is the inductive hypothesis. So we're going to say very clear, like this is, we're just gonna say, we're gonna test the thing on the, just as we did before on the inside, with the last value. So again, this is just the, the left-hand side here is just the right-hand side of the previous one. The inductive hypothesis that implies with soundness error no larger than K minus one, Q plus one over the size of the field, that the, this linear combination on the right is itself close to V. And of course, that is simply the basic step that we had in the previous slide. So we're done and you just need to go and sum across all the k random values, and of course you get the claim bound of k q plus one over the size of the field. I'm gonna pause here. I, I wanna see the look of comprehension specifically on your face, but, and then I'll move on. <laughs> it seems legit, especially assuming the Yeah, yeah, we, we, should, we should go over that yeah, separately. Is that, it's actually really nice. It's pretty simple too, we can go over it. Okay, so this is the punchline. I think this is what we set out to prove. I think what's nice about it is you can chain these probabilistic implications really nicely together and they work very nicely. The proof itself is like a page and a half. You put everything together, it's including the basic step. It's like a page and a half, which is really nice. The notation's really clean and simple. And it intuitively maybe this induction step gives you an indication as to why this tensor code thing is the right thing as you're taking these linear, you basically, taking these matrices and folding the columns at every step, right? So it's like Fry maybe folds that way and you're folding this way or something. 
So hopefully that gives at least some indication to someone that a framework like this that's not the most abstract but still is sort of sharp enough to go in and prove some results is an interesting one and hopefully allows us to clean up and simplify notation, compactify notation of things that we already know and maybe even do some slightly new things like we did today. So uh, Min, thank you for the contributions to the basic proof and thank you everyone. So I'll open it up to questions. Uh, thanks, Alex. I I'm wondering how does this translate down to the formalisms of probability, like the, the axioms? Can you write this implication as a statement that the probability of this and that is bounded by this? And do the properties that you're using, such as I, I, I'm guessing transitivity or whatever, translate down to the axioms of probability? For example, I'm wondering, like, what is your probability space? All these things is this in the paper? Yeah, yeah. We we don't we don't like have like a sample space and like define a filtration or whatever over it. Like, it's very very basic probability that you need. You just think of it as just normal logical statements, like contrapositive, whatever you want to do, and chaining together logical implications. Okay and just now impose a soundness error on top of that, right? There's like apparently another, we had never seen, we kind of made this up, right? Because we, the way this came up is we were writing some of these proofs out on a whiteboard and in our office and we just started rewriting them in this way because first of all, it takes less space and it was nice and so it just also felt like a good way of doing proofs. But you can chain them together and compose them and you can also take contrapositive and so forth, and just the probabilities would either negate or they would sum. Like you can take a union bound and so forth. Sometimes you would want something sharper than that, right? Like for instance, here we just, at the end, we just summed everything together, right? Which turns out to be fine. Right? Yeah, because in, in cryptography, as you may know, like there's it's often the, the, the problem of if I, if I go a little bit too high level and I, I use probabilities and implications. For example, if the number of implication steps is dependent on the execution, for example, it's like a, a polynomial of the of whatever security parameter, then it actually I mean, doesn't really work out, right? Trouble. So you need to be very yeah. careful of what are we doing here. That's right. Okay. That's right. That's right. You don't you don't get to avoid that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then then uh... Oh, wait, there's somebody in the back too. Okay. Hi. So we'll we'll take both. Yeah. So the uh, the key result, which is the in the background. Yeah. So that's exactly the same as the one in uh, Ben's paper, right? So it's that the is exa basically exactly the yeah. same. So the, the improvement one. is just the two, right? It's just the two factor. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Right. yeah. And Ben is very good at math, so we should we should go back and triple check it just to make sure. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So it's uh, Q plus one divided by the field side. Yeah. 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 Cool. Thanks. There you go. Uh, is this on? Yes, it is. Uh, yeah, and, and by the way, um, you, you shouldn't undersell getting rid of that factor of two. It's actually, in, in the most recent version, it's stated as like a would be nice, right? Like kind of a conjecture essentially, like can, can you get rid of that factor of two? So that's actually pretty good if, 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 if you can. Okay, maybe we just add it to the paper or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I was just going to follow up on this. I mean, to me, it's, it's pretty clear how you make this precise grounded in probability theory, you basically say that the, the locus of the parameter space where the left hand thing is true and the right hand thing is not true, right, namely where the implication fails, that that locus would be bounded in size by something. And then when you do the chaining, it's kind of clear that you're taking a union of these loci, right? And, and exactly. of course, you can take a union bound there and then you just add them. So uh, exactly. to me, it's pretty reasonably evident, like, how to unroll this formalism into something that, right? Is that fair? Yeah, exactly. And far better stated than me, as always. Does it work? Yeah. So thanks for the talk. So uh, I fully agree. Like, uh, I mean, all the proof systems are typically built uh, by, uh, by an IOP where you have all the random reductions. Uh, Seems to me like if you, when it comes to linear algebra, that might be maybe a good uh, generalizing framework for general linear codes. But it seems to me it's just, or did you ever think of like a complementing picture that uh, is more centric to algebraic geometry codes? You know, even even the example with the Van der Bond matrix and so on. Yeah. 
it can be all uh, again played down to Schwartz simple uh, in the appropriate setting. Not claiming exactly in that way, but uh, it's, so it's just, it seems to me like there is a lot of potential of uniformization of all different struct. Uh, let's stay for a second just with univariate snark snarks mm. or the IOP. There's a lot of potential uh, of, uh, of unification in terms of the algebraic objects you use on which you do Schwartz simple. Personally, I'm not, but it's just my personal taste, I'm not so much a big fan of linear algebra. Because uh, what you often lose is the connection. Look even at, at, at FFT based encoders. Uh, you could, like base fold, you could write it down, you know, uh, with all uh, define your foldable, how do they call it, foldable fold code? Yeah. And, I have uh, a funny story about but that. But what, what, what it hides, in my, in my opinion, it's just a personal opinion, I might, might be wrong here, is uh, you can do foldable codes. That's just a, as a generalization of Reed Solomon codes to some algebraic geometric codes, including uh, uh, Freibinius like additive FFD codes and so on. But just long sh questions short, did you ever think of like a complementary unifying framework in the sense of uh, the algebraic codes or the geo algebraic objects? Yes. So in this case, we, so a few things. One is, generally speaking, the abstraction of linear algebra is you can explain to an undergraduate and so forth. So in this setting, funny enough, actually with, with uh, Basefold, the thing that we have described, so we have in our paper sort of a, pr a basic proof of Fry using just these probabilistic implications. And it turns out that actually the thing we used was itself based, which fits felt, very nicely, and you can do it in that framework. Now, could you go a level higher in abstraction? Actually, where most of the things break down is that we end up just working in code-based things in general, right? And so the higher level abstractions that we've been mostly curious about have been, can you have like a module theoretic? generalization. For example, the stuff that we have here, which turns out to be similar to some other work. In terms of more general codes and constructions therein, any linear code would fit naturally inside of the framework, right? Because you can describe it simply as you take a generator matrix and multiply it by a vector, right? Ah, thanks. Uh, it seems to me exactly, you know, but it's, just, it's my personal opinion. So w once you move away from the algebraic picture to generate a matrix, you lose a lot of uh, background information. Le so potentially, my... but it turns out to be sufficient to prove things that are useful in the field. So the question is like, how much machinery and abstraction do you need to prove the thing that you want to prove? Agreed on and, that. And but... what is the barrier to entry for somebody coming in to utilize? Because it hides, so it, it hides like, the idea of the proof, no? What's that? You I mean, super, what is it's the like you write a high-level program in assembly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's you, the danger, no? That's right, that's right. And I, so I would argue that's, that's assembly, right? It's like, what is the minimum set of things that I actually need to do something? And, and by the way, I totally agree with you. I think there are, there's frameworks at multiple layers of abstraction that are interesting. I think there's like ones that are like super abstract now and you can't use to do anything. And then there's ones that I just need to come up with a new framework every time I'm looking at a new system, even though the tricks are overlapping, every single time to come up with my proof. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not that good in order to be able to have to figure it out every single time. And you can reuse a lot of the same trick, because it's basically the same. The, the punchline is, it's all the same stuff almost every single time, at least pertaining to these codes. Thank you. Yeah, but I think that would be a very interesting generalization. Maybe we should chat about it. I think it's, you make a really good point. Do we have any other questions? We have time for a couple more. Take this. It's a full room, so don't be shy. Yes, they are shy. <laughs> oh, One more? OK. We have a few minutes for just, your Just a side question. You were yes. mentioning uh, you, you did write down proof of fry. Exactly. Yes, yes, we, this, have, it, we uh, have it in the paper. Probably probabilistic reductor, uh, reduction chain. You also take into account the joint query? Oh, sorry? You take into account the joint query? Joint query? Like, you, like the classical fry, not like stir, where it's more easy to work round by round, from round to round. You know, class, uh, the, the classical fry, 
uh, where you just have the commit phase and then you jointly query all the proper committed or oracles. Yeah, yeah, so you don't have, it's not like commit and then query in the uh, and next round is again commit independent queries and so on. Yeah, we just sum in our case. I, I can pull, I can show you the proof, but we just, yeah, the, the queries are correlated in that case. I, I don't, I, I missed the stir talk this morning, so I don't know how to compare the two. That's the only version of Fry that we consider yeah. is one where they're exactly correlated. I think in their case, you have to, your, your queries are like, you're switching domains at every point. I, 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 don't know. I mean, yeah. STIR seems to be much simpler. I'm just asking because I was doing hard, you know, really understanding the right form of framework for, I mean, first of all, reading a proof in, in the proximity gaps paper from, uh, uh, yeah, you know what you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, the soundness proof of Fry, you know, because yeah. of the joint query, it's not that easy as usual, and you have to be very careful in, in writing down what is the relation you reduce by each folding step. Uh, yeah. it's because you have to always take into account the whole history and, and, and how it correlates in some sense. Yeah. So, so I was just wondering if, if you ever had it. Yeah, we have a naive one. You might need all of that stuff to get a, to look, to be honest with you, you to get a tight version of Fry. Our version of Fry is pedagogically interesting, we think. Right, so we don't okay. get a great bound necessarily. So you might need to consider sort of that adaptive behavior across of your querying just once and so forth in practical protocols. Right, so what we have is can you explain to somebody, pick somebody off the street that knows linear oh, okay. algebra, and say, hey, uh, let me show you. Take take a take a subspace and consider a recursive substructure, right, where you can so you, sort of essentially exactly what Basefold realizes that you can generalize this idea of Fry to a broader code. When you consider that you can decompose the vectors, uh, okay. So, so, so you're in sense, and then we just sum it. across, and so, it. so, and that, so it's, and then it it's, follows. The bounds, I guarantee mm. you, the bound is terrible. But, but it is, at least for me, it was great to work out a proof of because I, I, I read the, <laughs> I read the proximity gaps papers and so forth, and just the machinery and work that needs to go into it. I pull out half my hair and I don't follow. No, so, and not I, just I suspect you. that is a shared thing. There are people that are obviously far smarter, like yourself. That have actually done damage with these things. So, um, yeah, but it, the, that, that's that's the objective. Anyway, I can show it to you. Maybe we can strengthen it without getting too far down the rabbit hole of uh, that original proof. And my guess is you might need a little bit more machinery to get something fully tight. Here just happened to be really nice. I think you can get something tight, just very nicely because it just fits directly into the abstraction. And you're already working in this code setting. You're already dealing with these subspaces. Fry is a little bit more involved, at least to my eye. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Hi. Can you just uh, can you just show the injection step really quick? Yeah. By the way, I do need to jump to the main stage, um, so may I can show it to you maybe offline. Yeah, I can. Um, but thank you. Thank you, everybody. I'm sorry for that. Let's catch up after.